So now we reach the halfway point of my top 30 favorite movies. We're at number 15 here, and I kind of wish this came out around, th this was around Thanksgiving that we were doing this because this would perfectly fit our next movie that we're talking about here. But we are getting close to Christmas time. I mean, you could say it's kind of the same thing. Hell, AMC plays this on their Christmas pro lineup every year, so I guess we can consider this also kind of a Christmas movie too. But number 15 on my list, we are looking at my all-time favorite John Hughes film. It's not The Breakfast Club, it's not Sixteen Candles, or even Ferris Bueller's Day Off. It's actually the 1987 Steve Martin John Candy comedy, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. Now don't get me wrong, John Hughes is one of the most influential comedy writers of our time, and during the 80s he was behind a lot of the more memorable comedies that came out around that time, like the ones I previously mentioned, but also stuff like Uncle Buck and National Lampoon's Vacation and its sequel, uh, Home Alone, among many others. But this is the one I watch more and more. Planes, Trains, and Automobiles is honestly the movie that I think of when I think of the most perfect movie that Hughes has ever written and directed. Uh, basic story, you have Steve Martin as this high-strung marketing executive, Neil Page, who meets Del Griffin, played by John Candy, who's an eternally optimistic, overly talkative, and clumsy shower curtain ring salesman who seems to live in a world governed by a different set of rules. Uh, they share a three-day odyssey of misadventures, trying to get Neil home to Chicago from New York City in time for Thanksgiving dinner with his family. And, of course, this is not the first road trip movie ever made, but this was the first one that really... When you really look at it, kind of got it right from the get-go. I mean, both Steve Martin and John Candy were both top comedy draws at the time of this film's release, and they work really well off each other. You could definitely tell there's a chemistry between these two. You know, Candy's Del Griffith, while he's intended to not be a bright person overall, he does have a lot of charisma and personality and theories about how life works and how he makes a living, and you can honestly buy into some of these things, too. Granted, his motives are very questionable, but they do work, and the film does a very good job of showing how these motives work, most notably when there's a scene in the movie where they're trying to make extra money, and Dell is selling all these shower curtain rings to various people and consistently telling people different fibs about them. Like, they're talking about how one of them is like, it makes you look like Diane Sawyer from 60 Minutes, and like, they'll make you look younger, all that type of stuff. And you have Neil Page, who's kind of the straight man of the duo, who has a lot, also has a lot of personality, and while he blames Dell for much of what happens in the film, he realizes that from the get-go, there's something kind of odd about Dell's situation here. And even when he does blame him for something, it eventually comes up that it really isn't all his fault in the end. And like I said, the, he realizes right, kind of kind of throughout the course of the movie, and especially towards the end of the movie, that there is something about Dell that seems a little bit off here. And it's not until the end of the film when they realize what it is and that you really feel for both of them despite all the craziness that happened. You know, it also gives these. This movie also gives Steve Martin and John Candy the chance to step out of their typical comedic personas. You know, they were known for this at the time and try to go for sort of a more of a dramatic approach. Uh, a couple other people had tried to do this at several different points. Uh, Dan Aykroyd was in Driving Miss Daisy. Uh, Bill Murray tried his hand at drama around this time with The Razor's Edge. And uh, much like another movie we'll get to in this list, I think both Martin and Candy do a good job of combining the more comedic and dramatic moments to their performances and making it work really well here. We've seen over the years how Steve Martin's branched out into more dramatic roles, and has done a pretty good job with it. Stuff like, you know, Novocaine and Shop Girl and The Spanish Prisoner, but, you know, we never really got to see what John Candy could do with a more dramatic role. We didn't ne never really got a chance to see that because, unfortunately, he passed away seven years after this movie came out, and when you really look back at some of the movies he's done with John Candy, he ad-libbed a lot with John Candy. You felt like that he was the one, like John Hughes was his guy that would let him let him pretty much do whatever he wants and he would find a way to make it work in terms of a in terms of a of the the, the elements of the storyline i mean this he did this with uh, uncle buck he did this i think with the great outdoors as well and he did this with home alone like like you remember him in home alone he's not just there to be john candy and in general he is a character that's more realized and there's a lot of footage on the cutting room floor for a lot of these movies that really kind of delves into Stuff that probably would have probably worked in the film, but really in terms of the editing overall, I think it works out in the end. I'll talk about that in just a second before we wrap things up on that. But um, um, it's also a shame that this movie has been reported, repeatedly done to death since its release because most of them don't do anything different than this movie did. And I think you won't know what the biggest retread of this was with what that we got, which was the horrifically bad due date which came out in 2010 it was like todd phillips's follow-up to the hangover 
where they did absolutely nothing but basically redid planes, trains, and automobiles and added raunchy jokes just for the sake of being incredibly raunchy, adding elements to the storyline that don't make any, any kind of sense, trying to be an R-rated comedy that was on the level of The Hangover when the original planes, trains, and automobiles was an R-rated movie too. Granted, it was only R-rated because of one scene in particular, and I'll talk about that in just a little second here, but... You know, you expect a whole with that film. You expect a whole lot better from the guy who had just come off of the big success of The Hangover, and the rising stardom of Zach Galifianakis, and not even a guy like Robert Downey Jr. could save that train wreck overall. And if your biggest concern for, with that movie was the same plot of planes, trains, and automobiles to add raunchy material, the original planes, trains, and automobiles was also rated R, and it didn't have to resort to adding numerous raunchy jokes just to get your attention. It focused its attention on character development and good written comedy. Due Date did not do any of that. In fact, you know, if you take out one classic scene in that movie, along with a couple of other little tiny scenes here, they would have easily gotten away with a PG-13 rating. But honestly, I'm glad they didn't because... Um, it becomes a better. It it made it a much funnier movie than it had any right to be. And I mean, this is such a great funny comedy that works because it does everything a good comedy should do. It provides good characters, gives some good heartwarming pro emotional performances, mixes some drama in there, a lot of really good hilarious moments. Steve Martin and John Candy just work off each other so well. I consider it to be John Hughes's greatest m movie, and he's made a lot of great movies throughout the course of his career, but me, personally, this is personally my favorite film that he's ever done. And despite the, that, like I said before, there is a lot of stuff from this movie that was cut out, and, you know, I, if you find that, is I'll put a link to this guy's channel, that he, uh, Hats Off Entertainment, who talks a lot about John Hughes movies. Um, he did a really good video talking about the lost version of some of Planes, Trains, and Autobius, because supposedly there's an extended cut of this movie that's around four hours long. And, um, you know, the interesting thing about Planes, Trains, and Automobiles is that it's already a great comedy at 85 minutes long. It's a well-edited movie. It's very funny. It's very tightly put together. And honestly, you would have never imagined that this there could be this long of a cut, let alone a three-hour cut of the movie. I think I said four hours before, but I'm sorry about that. But, um, yeah, there's a three-hour cut of this movie that apparently exists, and yeah, it would have been a little bit more interesting to see those deleted sequences, but at the same time, should we see the extended cut and expect to see a film just as good as the original film? Like, it's a tricky question because you could say the same thing for something like what... You could say that it'd be cool to see the stuff they cut out, but at the same time, you'd be in kind of a similar situation to what Fox did a couple years ago. Back around 2007, Fox did this thing where they re-released uh, Big and That Thing You Do on DVD with these extended editions. Uh, that Thing You Do is also one of my favorite movies that we'll eventually get to uh, pretty soon. And they included bo – both of them included – added in deleted scenes. They even extended a few scenes cut from the original release. But both of those films, when they got those, they felt kind of unnecessary and kind of pointless. I mean, it'd be cool to see that footage overall, but to add that into the movie – in a movie that's pretty all, pretty much fine as it is already, it just feels kind of pointless adding it in there. And that's not to say that Plain Strange and Automobiles deleted scenes probably couldn't work. I mean, we've already seen the the scene where the air, where they're trying airplane food that's on the regular DVD and Blu-ray. And then last year we had that nice looking set that had all the deleted scenes on, that included on, that, a majority of the deleted scenes on there, including the one where they go to the at the Braveheart Inn they order the pizza. And uh, the pizza boy was actually it turns out to be the kid that was that ends up stealing their wallets later on in the movie. You don't even notice it; it's just like a random person that steals it. There's dialogue from the diner scene that's added in there. They added all these different things. Uh, one of those things that they added in that this that was in the uh, in the extended cut from the original script was there was a big subplot that I was really glad they cut out about Neil's wife thinking that Neil had cheated on her with another woman. There's like a number of pages in the script that they had where they expanded on how Neil's wife is getting more and more upset that Neil is sleeping with another woman, and that's why he hasn't made it home. And yeah, it would have made the last line of the movie work better as a sigh of relief that Neil wasn't lying to her and was telling the truth. But again, I'm glad they didn't do that because that's one of those old cliches of the big misunderstanding I feel could have dragged the film down a lot if it had done the wrong way. And, you know, John Hughes... Maybe he could have made it work. He may have found a way around it, but I'm glad that's, what, that's one of those ones that got cut out. Um, Michael McKeon's character, who plays a cop in here, had a bigger role in this movie. There was a big thing that was cut out of the final scene, which I'm going to go into spoilers in, here. If you don't want to be spoiled by this, um, kind of back away now. But, uh, of course, the end of the movie, uh, Neil asked the – 
puts it together that there's something going on with Dell, and he ends up seeing Dell in the bus stop station, and Dell's like, and Neil's like, Dell, what are you doing here? And it was, why aren't you at home? And Dell's just like, why well, don't have a home? Mary's been dead for eight years. And then after that, in the theatrical cut, it immediately cuts to you know Dell and Neil going to Neil's house and the happy ending that follows, and it works fine already as it is. But there was a lot more to that scene that was cut. There was like a bit in the coffee shop where Dell opens up about the death of his wife, his desire for commitment, for community, and what it was about Neil that made his attachment so special. And it did add a lot of emotional weight to Dell's backstory and why he calls the road his home and how stressed and depressed he can get during the holidays But because he doesn't have anybody to share with. And really, I think people can relate to that. And even to this day, after John Candy's death, Steve Martin says the addition of the line, that's why I attach myself to other people, but this time I couldn't let it go. It still made him teary-eyed to this very day, and you can definitely see why. Like, that film's last scene is trimmed down a lot, including the film ending right as Neil and Dell make it to home, and the film ends around Thanksgiving dinner. Remember, like the little bits and pieces of Neil thinking about his family while the subway was supposed to be part of an original, a, a larger ending, but was later repurposed for that scene. There's definitely some stuff in there that I think was could, could have been interesting to see overall. I don't know if it would have. Been, I'm pretty sure it wouldn't have made the movie better than it already is because the movie already works fine as it is in the original cut. And um, I am glad that we got to see some of that footage that was on that disc last year, but it really is one of those movies that I think is perfectly fine for what it is. I don't want to see this get tarnished as much as it, can, as it possibly can. I mean, I don't know if they're still working on this supposed remake with Will Smith and Kevin Hart. I like those guys, but, but um, like, please don't remake Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. Just please don't. I'm begging you, Paramount, do not do this. But... Um, it's been a while since they talked about it, though, so maybe, maybe somebody came to their senses and says, there's no way we can remake this and make it better than the original, because Plain Strange Automobiles is a classic movie. It's one of the best comedies ever. John Hughes' best movie overall. Steve Martin and John Candy at the top of their game. It's one I have to watch every single Thanksgiving. It's a classic movie. If you haven't seen it, get out there and see it. You're missing something very, very special. This is my 15th favorite film of all time, Plain Strange and Automobiles, so... Ah, uh, yeah, a little bit longer than usual, but I kind of wanted to bring some points into this that probably wouldn't have been brought up with any of the other movies that we'll have on here. Maybe a couple of other ones we'll get to, but um, uh, next time, it'll be Christmas Day, and then we'll talk about my 14th favorite film of all time. But if you want to see what I said about Hoop Dreams, the last movie I had on here, uh, click the link down below. Check out some of the other videos I've done, and I'll see you guys next time. So thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Until then, take care.